Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, I will hand uh, the microphone over to Dr. Velasquez. Thank you, Dan, and thanks everyone for joining this morning and uh, and uh, for particularly in advance uh, to uh, those who are going to lead us through this discussion. So on March 13th uh, of 2020, um, Yale New Haven Health admitted their first patient was COVID. Um, uh, many of us may remember what we were doing that, that uh, week as we were kind of checking in with family, um, uh, looking at an uncertain future, trying to define what to do with our children um, as the world um, at, among, uh, around us uh, came to, uh, to, to a screeching halt in many ways. Um, it's it's uh, amazing in many ways to look back now a year, uh, a little bit over a year ago, and since then, um, we've had over 100,000 patients admitted to Yale New Haven ho a Hospital with COVID-19. Um, we've had, uh, I'm sorry, 100,000 uh, diagnosed with COVID-19 at Yale New Haven Hospital. We've had, uh, at the same time, um, nearly 100,000 uh, vaccinations uh, completed amongst us uh, um, uh, in New Haven. And so there's been um, a tremendous uh, loss, um, uh, but at the same time, uh, many successes. When I think back at this year, I, uh, I um, reflect on three um, words um, that I think summarize to me um, what I've gained uh, from this, uh, this last year's experience. And, and, and uh, those words are, are humility, um, uh, resilience, and innovation. I think in humility, I think we hopefully have all um, now um, uh, uh, more completely recognize the challenges we face as individuals, as parts of communities, and are hopefully humbled um, by the challenges um, uh, that we face on a daily basis that sometimes get brushed aside, and perhaps uh, more uh, uh, recognize more fully um, what we have around us uh, that's good and uh, what we uh, have around us that needs to change. Um, resilience, I think, relates to the fact that um, when the chips are down, I, I do think that most of us will um, stand up tall and face uh, uh, reality and, and move forward to help others. That's what why we got into this profession um, as, uh, as physicians and nurses and, and other healthcare workers. And it's uh, it's been um, uh, bolstering for me personally to see the tremendous resilience of our of our faculty and our staff um, rise to the challenge of. Uh, of an uncertain future with risk to themselves. Um, I also want to highlight the resilience of our uh, uh, of educators and and, and uh, investigators who um, have really uh, uh, worked through some major challenges, uh, disruptions to laboratory uh, activities, to a life's work in many cases, to uh, uh, funding cycles that uh, put food on the tables of their of their team. Um, and have tried and have worked uh, through that to uh, to to really uh, keep um, uh, moving forward and uh, and to consider um, how to succeed in a new era. And lastly, um, innovation. I, I think you'll hear today about how we've uh, um, responded to the challenge of the last year as a section, as a department, as as a university and health system to. Uh, to innovate um, in, the care, in the care of our patients and how we uh, care for each other, how we work with uh, uh, in, in, uh, <coughs> in educating the young. Um, uh, we haven't uh, had successes con consistently. We've uh, learned a lot along the way, but I think um, that innovation and spirit, um, I think will push us forward. Uh, and, and I think uh, really, I think I am very positive of the future. What are the realities? Um, uh, Today, we have 121 patients in the hospital. That's an increase from the day before, an increase from the day before that. Um, we certainly aren't seeing um, that rapid uh, reduction in case volume um, that we saw when we, uh, after the peak of 450 uh, last April, that uh, went down to, I think, six. Um, and I, I think this is the way of the future. We are going to see a constant um, uh, impact of COVID-19 uh, for the foreseeable future. Maybe that's related to the B117 variant, maybe other factors, but I think we'll uh, continue to learn 
and uh, and uh, and and work within that environment that I think makes COVID-19 part of our reality for the foreseeable future. So um, I I uh, wanted to um, just start this this really uh, exciting grand rounds to just highlight these points um, uh, and uh, share with you how um, fortunate I feel to be part of this team and how proud of the work that everyone uh, I am of the work that all all of you have done. Um, before we start, so I think it would be important. Um, we've uh, not only uh, had tremendous loss in this uh, nation and, and the, in, the, in the world at large due to COVID-19, but I think um, this, these challenges of this disease have also um, uh, unsurfaced a lot of other uh, uh, social uh, disturbances and challenges that have had us have had us had to face. Uh, many things that we've uh, ignored into the past. So um, for all those who have lost and suffered um, uh, for this, uh, in this last year, I'd like to just maybe spend um, the next 30 seconds to a minute in a moment of silence and reflection um, to, uh, to uh, reflect back on those and, and the families that have suffered um, uh, during this time uh, before we get started. So I ask all of you to, to uh, take the time that you need to reflect on what you've learned over the last year. Um, take those moments uh, day in and day out. Um, and uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Dan and uh, maybe we can get uh, going with the rest of the agenda. Thank you very much, Dr. Velasquez, for that moving introduction. Um, now, please to turn over the mic to Dr. Joyce Onshaw. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for asking me to participate in this um, important Grand Rounds. It's an honor for me to be able to speak with, um, with everyone today. So in reflecting back on this last year, one of the things that just kind of struck me as the year continued to go on was how, you know, we had no idea what was going on and we were learning every day. There was something new that we could um, that we that we took away, and there was something new that we could use to treat um, patients with COVID. And um, for first, I'm going to start talking about two cases that um, that came on early in the um, the pandemic, and uh, that that uh, our fellows were actually able to write up as case reports. Um, so I will go ahead and just start with that. So our first case. Um, was uh, written up by our fellow Will Hindle uh, Kittle. So one of the things that happened was that uh, we had a patient who's 65 years old, has a history of hypertension and obesity and came into the hospital with two weeks of dyspnea and exertional chest tightness. He was admitted to the hospital under observation and as with all patients who have, um, you know, in their mid sixties with chest tightness and shortness of breath, he was ordered for a stress test. Um, and he was able to run on the treadmill um, for a good nine or 10 minutes. And uh, the stress nuke images were actually normal. But if you, uh, some of you don't know, we do have CT attenuation. And what we saw with the CT was that the patient had pulmonary patchy ground glass opacities in bilateral lower lobes. Um, and given these findings, uh, the team actually called the primary team and said, you may wanna check him for COVID, um, which did in fact come positive. So we actually diagnosed COVID with a stress test. Um, this was, I guess, great for the patient because he now had a diagnosis of why he was having shortness of breath and chest tightness. But one of the things that it opened our eyes to was the fact that at this time of, um, as you can see, it was published in May of last year. So this is probably in April. 
And so at that time, all of our staff was just wearing a surgical mask, if, you know, if even that. Um, and so this case actually helped us to be able to advocate for our staff and for ourselves as to, you know, what is the proper PPE for a patient or for personnel who are um, in the midst of a patient who's doing an exercise stress test. And this kind of helped to shape the guidelines in the future um, for the rest of the year in terms of, you know, maybe we need to just do regadenosin stress tests um, initially, or if we are having a patient exercise, we need to give our personnel proper PPE. But again, just learning as we kind of went along. Um, but it was a really scary time for the, for the staff because now they were scared that they were exposed to COVID um, pretty close up. You know, our nurses are about two feet away when they're taking the blood pressures. Um, but then a learning point so that we could protect all the rest of the staff in the future. Um, and this it was another interesting case. Uh, right around the end of the summer, we were starting to hear about COVID and how um, it can cause a hypercoagulable state for the patients. And, you know, we were talking about pulmonary emboli and DVT. And then this case came along and there was a 29 year old male without any past medical history who presented to the hospital with abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. After an episode of emesis, he developed chest pain. His initial labs showed a white count of 12.9, a CRP of 149, a D-dimer of 4.18 and a troponin of 0 0.15. Um, given the elevated CRP and his chest pain, he was tested for COVID and it was positive. Um, you see his original uh, admission EKG wasn't very striking at all, but 14 hours after his admission, he developed severe chest pain, and then he ended up having these anterolateral ST elevation um, on the EKG. He was taken to the cardiac catheterization lab, which basically revealed a total occlusion of the mid-LED and significant thrombus, as you can see with the IBIS. Um, a drug eluding stent was placed into the LED and with resolution of TIMI3 flow. That then brought up the fact of, well, what are we supposed to do with this 29-year-old healthy guy who ended up thrombosing his LED? And we were able to get our, our hematology colleagues on board with the case. Um, and it was decided that he need, the patient would need to be sent home with Lovenox and then eventually transitioned to, um, to a Pixaban. Uh, so this was kind of very striking for me because we had only been hearing about clots, you know, in the legs and in the lungs, but I guess why not also in the coronary arteries? And so this, you know, basically was one of the cases that shed, that showed to me, like, this COVID can do anything. Like, we just don't know enough about it to, and, and it can, and COVID presents in so many different ways um, in our patients. Um, and this uh, case was actually written up by our uh, fellows, Emily Ong and Yulanka. Um, and so uh, those were the two interesting cases that I thought would, um, were, were really important teaching points, especially early on in the COVID um, time period. So with that, um, I will transition over to COVID and, what, and how it impacted cardiac rehabilitation. So the first case of COVID uh, in Connecticut was announced in, on March 8th. Um, and at that time, Yale New Haven Health and Yale University moved to get the ambulatory patients either rescheduled for a month or two later um, or switched to telehealth. Um, and as, our, as Dr. Velasquez said, our first patient was admitted at Yale um, on March 13th. And at that time, it was decided to shut down the cardiac rehabilitation sites, um, mostly because we weren't able to social distance and also because by March 16th, Governor Lamont shut down all of the gyms. At that time, the staff was very concerned that the progress of the patients who were in the exercise program would be lost. Um, they decide, we decided that uh, they should maintain their weekly phone calls with patients, but they were kind of discouraged that the patients were not able to exercise and keep up their progress. And so um, one of our staff meetings, uh, we kind of inspired the team to make exercise videos for the patients during the COVID shutdown. Uh, we had to obtain approval from the Yale New Haven Health System leadership and also legal to be able to create and post the videos onto our website for our patients to use at home. 
And we actually successfully were able to do that. This is our um, cardiac rehabilitation uh, website. And the patients are able to click on these, watch our videos, and all of our YouTube videos were put up here. And so this was um, basically uh, an effort from all six sites across the, uh, the health system. And you can see that the patients are able to um, just play these YouTube videos uh, at home and still kind of keep their exercise um, going. So that was a really important thing that we were able to do for our patients. Um, and some of our colleagues actually also had their patients go on it who weren't even in, enrolled in cardiac rehab as yet. So that continued on for quite a long time, you know, from basically March 13th until the date of July 13th. So it was quite a long time. But as the pandemic improved, uh, it was decided that we could actually reopen, but with a few adjustments. Our intakes were done over the telephone um, instead of having the patients come in one-on-one -on -one with our staff. Patient education was giving, given while the patient was exercising as their se sessions were then limited to an hour. And in our programs, in the, um, we created these pods where the patient would be in, um, in this little pod that was six feet apart from each other. And um, they had a chair and two pieces of equipment that they could use as they exercise through the program. And we actually at the initially had uh, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, staff to patient or a two-on-one -on -one, uh, to patient to staff ratio so that um, our staff who was in full PPE because the patients were exercising uh, would be able to take care of the patients as they were exercising. Um, and so we reopened our sites on July 13th. And so this is how your patients that you have referred to us have been exercising safely. Um, as our numbers started to increase by March of 2021, um, since our positivity rate remained low, uh, we decided that we could increase the class size. And in order to do that, we had to rearrange the machines and add these sneeze guards so that patients were able to exercise in their pods and also feel safe that, uh, that they were, now that they were a little bit closer, that they would not have any, um, you know, contamination by other uh, patients who were exercising. The patients were all exercising with surgical masks on as well. But in order to have the patients feel safer, we did provide the sneeze guards. And in Brantford, we also did the same thing where we put the sneeze guards in. Uh, patients would have their pod and they would have their telemetry monitor on their chair waiting for them. So when they entered and got their temperature checked, they would say, oh, they were told which pod to go to and that's where the patient would exercise. Um, CMS, specifically Medicare approved telehealth for virtual cardiac rehab. Um, and so from November of 2020 uh, on, we were working with IT and legal to be able to do these virtual visits. And on February 10th, 2021, we were able to hold our first uh, virtual cardiac rehab session. And here you see Skylar, um, one of our exercise physiologists and our patient EC, who was so excited that he was actually participating in cardiac rehab as he said, use my picture anywhere. Um, that, and, uh, and this was our first successful uh, virtual cardiac rehab session. There are a few issues in terms of IT and whatnot, but we have worked through all of that. And our future of cardiac rehab is that we have already made plans um, with IT and legal to be able to do group virtual cardiac rehab sessions. And we'll basically utilize this as our numbers uh, continue to increase. So right now, the patients who are Medicare and Yale Health Plan, those patients will qualify for virtual cardiac rehab. And so if you have any patients who would, uh, who would be able to participate from either Yale Health Plan or Medicare, please refer them over and specifically say, you know, virtual cardiac rehab. For our virtual cardiac rehab patients, we do have them exercise in person um, initially during the intake. And that, it, that way we can see if they have any bad arrhythmias or if they aren't able to exercise safely without um, people uh, watching them, that we can actually confirm that they are good for virtual cardiac rehab at home or not. Um, so we are excited to be able to continue uh, providing cardiac rehab to all of you and all of your patients. And um, please continue to refer them over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce. Uh, I'll now uh, pass the mic over to Dr. Alexandra Lansky.
Okay, can you guys see my screen? We are not able to see your screen. Okay, hang on one second. How about now, can you see it? Uh, we can see your desktop and the slides, but it's not in full presenter mode. Okay, can you see it? Yep. Okay, fabulous. perfect. Okay, wonderful. So, um, and hang on, I'm gonna try and get my video going. Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank Eric for um, having me part of this, um, the, this session. I think it's very special. Um, you know, I feel very privileged to be, to be part of this entire group. What I wanted to do um, during the next five to 10 minutes is really talk about something that, you know, talking about innovation is one of our studies called the Colstat uh, trial as a case example of something that we have done in the past year. Um, it's a very pragmatic uh, clinical study, and I think it um, it engaged the entire healthcare system, and I and I think brought everybody together at a time where everybody felt very um, isolated. And I've been very impressed by what we've been able to do throughout the healthcare system. So. Um, this is a concept actually it started on zoom as so many things uh, begin on zoom these days um, every thursday at lunchtime um, i hold a research meeting that it's basically a brainstorming session for our students our residents some of our fellows join um, postdocs etc and it's basically an opportunity to to come and present either a paper or a concept or a clinical study or you know just an idea and pitch it and we can we discuss it etc. And um, this time last year it was Tayab Shah. So at the time he was uh, my postdoc. He had been with me for a couple of years. Um, Tayab is currently uh, uh, an intern in uh, internal medicine at Yale. And uh, he pitched this concept. So the idea was to combine colchicine and statins uh, to prevent um, uh, complications. So, um, okay, here we go. So just by way of background, um, there, are, there have been a number of small scale um, studies, randomized clinical trials uh, in the hospitalized patients with COVID-19 where the use of colchicine um, actually seems to be improving uh, clinical outcomes. Many of these are based on biomarkers. And you can see in this meta-analysis, it's small, 468 patients, um, there, there's a suggestion of a mortality benefit. Now, since we started our trial, as you can see on the, on the right here, the Col-Corona trial, uh, which is an outpatient study, much larger scale of 4,500 patients. Um, didn't quite meet at some point, but uh, there was a trend here for reduction in death and hospitalization with the use of uh, colchicine in this patient population. And in patients with uh, PCR positive or confirmed um, COVID-19, there was actually a reduction in hospitalization, mechanical ventilation, and all-cause mortality. So the idea behind our clinical study is that we wanted to look at the combination of colchicine and statins in, in this patient population that was actually hospitalized um, uh, without severe uh, COVID complications. Um, the reasons for doing this, of course, we, you know, there's very well documented anti-inflammatory effects of both drugs. Uh, the safety pro profile is very well um, established. Uh, both drugs are relatively cheap and available throughout, uh, throughout the world. So um, this is the trial design, very simple. Um, we aim to enroll 466 patients. This is an open label superiority study. So it's COVID-19 positive patients um, admitted to the hospital, non-ICU. 
Um, and I'll tell you about the, the whole epic build because I think in many ways that is you know, part of the innovation that we um, have implemented and I think it's very exciting. Um, so it's a very simple one-to-one -one randomization of the combination of uh, colchicine and rosuvastatin versus standard of care. Uh, patients are actually screened uh, using EPIC um, and treated within 40, uh, 48 hours of admission and then treated for up to 30 days or until discharge, whichever happens first. And then we um, follow them with a phone call in 60 days. Um, our primary endpoint here, you can see it's progression to severe COVID-19 disease based on um, the WHO score of five to eight or arterial venous thromboembolic complications, including DVT, PE, MI, stroke. Uh, we do have a primary safety um, outcome looking at um, adverse events uh, related to the medications and a uh, number of um, secondary endpoints. Um, everything in this study is actually based on standard of care. So there are no um, study specific uh, requirements. Um, we've embedded a, a clinical event committee uh, to adjudicate all the primary and, and major secondary endpoints. We have a data safety monitoring board that's gonna be overseeing the, um, the conduct of the trial. Uh, we did get funding from the American Diabetes Association and we'll be doing a uh, diabetic um, um, sub-analysis. And uh, the trial was actually reviewed by FDA and, and deemed to be exempt from IND requirements. And um, we got uh, HIC uh, approval uh, through uh, for the entire network. Um, just very high level. This is uh, just to, um, uh, you know, the test was a test of superiority. Uh, we're looking at 80% power. You can see here the assumptions uh, in terms of the control event rate is assumed to be 44%. And we're looking to show a 30% uh, reduction in that primary endpoint. So um, again, I think what's really uh, novel about this study and what we've been able to do is, is to program the entire study through EPIC. This took us quite a bit of time. It was uh, really, I wanna thank Tarek and, and Nihar for, for, um, for giving me the idea of doing this and, and putting me in touch with the whole EPIC team. Um, um, and essentially what we've done is we programmed the, um, some of the, the key criteria, selection criteria uh, within EPIC. Once we select patients, they actually uh, pushed to the um, in-basket of our coordinators who then can go into the records, screen the patients. If the patients meet the criteria, then they're called uh, to see if they're interested in, in participating in the study. And if they are, then we will go over, meet the patient, uh, get informed consent, document that in EPIC. And randomization, again, is uh, built within uh, the EPIC system. So we randomize the patient. If the patient then is uh, randomized to drug, then there is an automatic order set that comes up with all the uh, drugs that are right there and essentially um, the providers, uh, myself and some of the providers can order the uh, medications. We have uh, the lab values popping up to see if we need to reduce the dose and simply accept and the patient is uh, randomized and enrolled in the trial. So this has made it extremely easy to implement and I think very uh, user-friendly from, um, from a, a, a clinician standpoint. So this is, uh, this is the study team. And because we've done it through EPIC, we're, we're really able to uh, enroll and implement this throughout the whole healthcare system. So you can see here, we have uh, Gil Lancaster from Bridgeport <coughs> at Greenwich. <coughs> Chris Howes has been engaged and we, we've reached out to the uh, hospitalists. Um, at Lawrence and Memorial, Brian Camby has been involved and it's just been an incredible team effort 
to really bring everybody together. Marianne McCarthy, who uh, is the project manager for the, for the study, has do, done a phenomenal job. And every Friday we have our team calls. And I have to say, this is probably the most fun call that we have all week. And everybody is extremely, extremely engaged. So um, this just shows you um, the enrollment. So it definitely took us some time to uh, program this within, within the set system and go through all the approvals, et cetera. But we, we initiated the study back in November. We deployed it at on main campus. You can see that within the first couple of months, we had about 15 to 20 patients. Uh, that we debugged the system. There was some little glitches that we dealt with, but then uh, in January, we opened it up to the network and you can see what happened. So <laughs> Greenwich was absolutely engaged. I mean, all the, uh, the uh, I mean, the whole network really sort of stepped in and, and uh, started contributing patients and got very excited about this. In fact, we even enroll patients over the weekends. We've had hospitalists coming forward and wanting to participate in this. It's really been fun. And you can see in, in four and a half months, uh, we've enrolled 154 patients. You can see the breakdown here based on um, uh, each one of the, uh, the sites. So what we're looking at here, this is actual, you're looking at projected here, we're looking to probably enroll up until September, we're going to have to adjust that in terms of our projections. We do plan to have an interim analysis that's going to be reviewed by the data safety monitoring board for uh, the overall safety of the study, but also for futility, so we'll have to see how that goes. Um, but overall, you know, I think this has been um, really a success and, you know, obviously it's a big team effort and many people have uh, contributed to this, but it is an example of what we have been able to put in place. Um, it is a new way of doing, uh, again, very pragmatic uh, randomized clinical trials within the um, healthcare system. I think we've proven that we're uh, very much able to do that. And we're certainly very uh, able to engage the entire um, uh, uh, healthcare team, including, um, you know, our hospitalists. And I think that has been uh, just a pleasure to work with everybody and pull the whole team together. We're looking at using this same system now in um, uh, a multi-center study, so going outside of the Yale network in, in a couple of different programs that we're working on right now. And uh, again, I mean, it's a work in progress, but I think this is just a great example of what, um, you know, what the past year has done. It has made us think outside of the box and it's pushed us in directions that I don't think we would have uh, done had it not been for this pandemic. So I'll, I'll close there um, and uh, we can open up for discussion at, at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lansky, for, for sharing that remarkable story. I'm now pleased to pass the microphone to Dr. Hyung Chung. Thank you, Dan. Well, thanks. I echo the others in thanking um, Eric Elizabeth, Dan, and others who organized this uh, meeting and giving me an opportunity to speak with you today. Um, you know, it's been a whirlwind year for all of us. Um, I thought I would just share with you kind of things from my perspective as a as a mostly a basic science researcher who um, really made a fairly big pivot uh, in the time of COVID, as I think partly as uh, the labs were. Um, shutting down in the beginning of the pandemic, and want to share with you some of the uh, some of the investigative work that we've been involved in um, carrying out um, during this time. So I thought I would just start off with key kind of key take home points. Um, we've been involved in a number of highly collaborative projects with multiple um, groups here at Yale. Um, I thought I would just share with you some of our key findings. Uh, first finding um, that our group um, made was that this early neutrophil activation does seem to be a, pretty, a fairly critical um, 
precedent to um, critical illness in COVID-19. And what we found that to be highly prognostic for disease outcome in patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19 in our system. Um, we've also made the observation that endothelial injury um, seems to be a highly prognostic factor in predicting who becomes critically ill with COVID. And this was some uh, finding that was made fairly early in the pandemic, which have been uh, validated by multiple other, um, other investigator groups. Um, some of the studies that we've been involved in looking at the long haulers um, in collaboration with colleagues at Duke um, identify the fairly unique inflammatory and fibrotic signal that seems to correlate fairly strongly with persistent impaired lung function um, in the post-COVID state. And wanted to touch upon some of the lessons learned in trying to maneuver the clinical trial landscape um, as a, you know, basically somebody who is quite naive to the process during the height of the pandemic. So unfortunately, you know, I just pulled this from New York Times this morning, you know, the numbers in Connecticut and New England has kind of gone up, has started to creep up again, as Eric had mentioned in the beginning. Um, you know, fortunately with uh, vaccination rollout, hopefully these numbers will uh, come back down again. But, you know, I just thought I would just share some pics over the past 12 months, really went by so quickly, starting from initial shutdown of schools, distance learning, um, to CVRC and pretty much all uh, basic science labs being shut down in the, um, throughout the campus. Um, having a wife who's a pulmonary critical care and in the early days of pandemic, not really knowing the, the potential uh, infection risk. You know, we ended up getting her an Airbnb for, uh, for a few weeks. She was in the ICU for a couple of weeks and then ended up quarantining her for a couple more weeks. That's our kids saying goodbye to her. And she sent me that pic selfie one day, I'm like, no, Goodness, I hate to be a patient seeing that in my, in my doctor, but you know that's fairly commonplace, as all of you know, um, in our ICUs. Um, ended up getting a dog, like some of you in the audience, perhaps, and I ran into her one day when I was on consult service and took a selfie in front of the ICU. So you know, it's been really a fortunate, um, and, you know, experience to to really pair up with Alfred Lee in hematology and also work with a number of other colleagues in pulmonary hematology and other, other departments here and sections at, at, at Yale and being involved in, you know, we think, you know, it's fairly impactful work um, in trying to better understand what drives uh, different aspects of COVID-19 from just starting from the coagulopathy, which was something you know, Alfred was very interested in, Alfred Lee in hematology, I'm sure many of you already know, and trying to find other other signals and other mechanisms that seems that may be playing a key role in the disease pathogenesis and de determining severity of disease. So, you know, I thought I would just kind of touch upon the three main findings. Um, you know, again, the neutrophil activation um, does seem to be a highly prognostic factor for critical illness in COVID-19. I mean, the key challenge in ch treating COVID-19 is that it's such a high, such a heterogeneous, heterogeneous disease. Um, where some patients are completely asymptomatic, whereas others require mechanical ventilation, ECMO, and ultimately die from the disease. So our initial interest was trying to find biomarker profiles at the earliest stage of um, these patients becoming symptomatic and sick enough to be hospitalized to see if that can help us prognosticate, prognosticate these patients before they become severely ill. And this was work um, spearheaded by Matt Meislich, who was an MBPAC student, Alex Pine, um, who's now a HEME fellow, Jason Bashai, who's a, a student working with David Van Dyke, um, also all of you know him in cardiology, and Alfred Lee. And what we did was we took a fairly reasonable number of samples from these co hospitalized COVID-19 patients that span from patients who are in the non-ICU, in, in, the, in the regular floors, as well as ICU, and did a profiling of a plasma from these patients, looking at various markers known to be involved in COVID-19, as well as other factors that really had no previous indication for being involved in COVID-19. And with the efforts of Jason and David, we identified that there were five markers in particular um, that are listed here, resistant lipokilin, HGF, IL-8, and GCSF, which were highly predictive of somebody actually requiring an ICU stay. And they were highly elevated in those patients who are in the ICU, as shown here in blue, compared to other patients who are not in the ICU, as well as controls. 
Um, we took this one step further and drew blood from these patients on day one of hospitalization. These were patients who were admitted to the normal uh, non-ICU unit on day one, and we measured resistant level. And what we found was that those individuals who had elevated levels of resistant on day one uh, were much more likely to require an ICU transfer, as shown here in red, uh, versus those who had a lower half median of resistant level, who most of them, most of whom did not require ICU transfer, and also the high resistant level was highly predictive of in-hospital mortality due to their COVID-19 hospitalization, whereas those with resistant level below median, um, you know, there were in, in this small group of patients, we saw no death in that patient population. So this early neutrophil activation seems to be a critical factor in determining who will likely to become severely ill during their COVID-19 hospitalization. I want to move over to the second finding, which is just a concept of endotheliopathy or endothelial injury. Um, you know, thrombotic and microvascular complications, as Joyce had mentioned previously, are key hallmarks of severe COVID, which seems to be fairly unique to COVID-19 versus other viral illnesses. So we set out to um, set out to evaluate whether endotheliopathy and other mechanisms of um, endotheliopathy and thrombotic processes may be key drivers of critical illness. Again, this was early work in the, in the pandemic um, led by George Goshua, who is a hematology fellow, Matt Meislis again, and Alex and Alfred, where we profiled these patient serums <clears throat> of plasma from patients hospitalized, both in the non-ICU as well as ICU, and wanted to really focus our efforts on measuring these endothelial injury markers, we would say, or endothelial activation markers. We found that soluble P-selectin, which is representative of endothelial and platelet activation, was significantly elevated in the ICU population. And also thrombomodulin, which is another marker of endothelial injury or activation, was, was elevated in the ICU population, but not quite significantly increased compared to the non-ICU. But when we um, divided the patients by their median thrombomodulin level, we found that, again, similar to what we saw with resistant, um, those with elevated thrombomodulin level had a significantly higher likelihood of, likelihood of in-hospital mortality compared to those with lower levels of thrombomodulin. Again, highlighting the fact that this endotheliopathy or endothelial injury does seem to be of critical role in COVID-19 pathogenesis. Um, we also in, participated in a study with uh, Harish Krokani from WashU, where we were very interested in looking at complement activation. Um, complement pathway is a, a, is a pathway that perhaps foreign to many of us, including myself before COVID-19. We learned about it in medical school, but you know, haven't really thought about it too much. But you know, it does seem to be a fairly unique process in COVID-19 where patients hospitalized with COVID have a significantly increased um, levels of complement activation as shown here by measuring soluble C5, B through nine. Also in COVID-19 patients, there was a significantly elevated levels of complement activation um, in those individuals who died as shown here. And this was highly unique to COVID-19 and not seen in patients with influenza as shown here. So this complement activation seems to be at least one key factor that drives the endotheliopathy and the thrombotic process in COVID-19. <clears throat> And just want to um, touch upon some of the work that we're doing in trying to profile the long haulers. Um, so, you know, in collaboration with Patty Lee, who was a formal Yale faculty in pulmonary critical care, who's now chief of pulmonary at Duke, um, we established collaboration to um, profile the plasma from these individuals um, who are discharged or recover from COVID, their acute COVID-19 illness, uh, but, you know, still maintain different degrees of uh, symptoms. Um, in the acute COVID, we and others have profiled these uh, pa patient plasma pretty extensively, but in the long haulers or post-COVID individuals, this has, this really has not been well phenotyped to date. So we really wanted to better understand what is going on in these long haulers haulers that might predict their severity of their illness. So um, Duke um, actually was fairly well established fairly early on in their post-COVID clinic, and they did pulmonary function tests in a good chunk of their, a good number of their patient population who had uh, recovered from their acute COVID. And what was found, again, we carried out a similar profiling of the plasma from these individuals at the time of their follow-up, and we kind of correlated it with the FVC uh, uh, from their pulmonary function test. 
And what I highlight here is that there are a set of markers that seems to be significantly elevated in those patients with the, uh, the most uh, decreased FVC at the time of their follow-up. And I just want to highlight two of these markers in particular, which is MMP7 or matrix metalloprotein A7, um, as well as lipocalin 2. Um, lipocalin 2 was a marker we found to be involved in this neutrophil activation that uh, we, I had previously mentioned. And MMP7 is a key driver of fibrosis. So there seems to be uh, this activation of a fibrotic process as well as neutrophil activation process that seems to be a key driving force of or at least associated with impaired uh, pulmonary function in the post-COVID follow-up stage. And what we're trying to do now is expanding this pool of 20 so or so patients to a larger cohort to uh, validate our findings in a larger patient population. So, you know, ultimately, I think our, you know, as a, as a practicing cardiologist, you know, our goal is to try to figure out ways to apply some of these findings to improve our patient care. Um, and what we're in the process of doing um, is trying to um, come up with uh, clinically applicable biomarker assays that would help us uh, conduct early prognostication, prognostication of these patients. Um, besides what we are currently doing, which include measuring their O2 requirements, CRP, and other factors, which certainly are important, but I think, you know, this may, identif identifying other markers um, may help us better prognosticate patients and perhaps improve our ways to triage these patients before they uh, kind of declare themselves to be severely ill. And trying to apply some of these mechanistic findings to um, really test out new therapeutic strategies. And to that end, uh, related to um, that goal, we've actually, you know, um, started two clinical trials, um, and certainly not as mature as um, Alexand what Alexandra described with Colstat. Uh, but these two trials were um, really focused on immunomodulatory factors in COVID-19. Uh, one study that we started uh, was looking at tofacitinib, which is a JAK inhibitor that's currently FDA approved for a number of autoimmune conditions, including rheumatoid arthritis, an IRAC4 inhibitor, which is a drug that's being developed for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which uh, has a pretty strong rationale for potentially having a role in um, as a therapy in COVID-19. And we really uh, benefited tremendously from mentorship of Alexandra Don on um, Schattinger in the CVRG group, as well as our coordinators, Vanessa Yu and Kelly Borges, who's been um, really leading this small group of a small team effort um, to really implement these studies um, here at Yale. And, you know, there is rationale for JAK inhibition in COVID-19, including data that was published recently with respect to baricitinib, which is a different JAK inhibitor, um, as well as another JAK inhibitor called ruxolitinib, where top-line data was just uh, released a few days ago, where both of these agents showed um, efficacy um, in patients who are hospitalized with severe and critical illness with COVID-19. Um, being a fairly... Um, early believer of this potential role of this pathway, we actually utilize an expanded access program method here at Yale to, um, to uh, treat some of these hospitalized patients with ruxolitinib, including patients who were actually requiring ECMO and for whom really there was not much else to offer at that time. And you know, initial experience with uh, four patients um, did see um, you know, different degrees of clinical improvement where three of the patients actually were discharged home, um, two of whom were on ECMO. And unfortunately, one of the last patient um, ended up dying from COVID-19. Um, what we're hoping with uh, tofacitinib is there is an ongoing and recently completed um, clinical trial, randomizable blinded placebo controlled um, in Brazil with anticipated results in the next one to two weeks. And our Yale study is currently ongoing. So as the dust settles in COVID-19, I think there are key immune factors that are driving the critical illness as well as a role of vasculopathy and coagulopathy. Um, there are a number of therapeutic modalities that have shown efficacy uh, to different degrees, and hopefully this will continue to um, gain, um, gain clarity as more trials um, uh, become uh, published. And you know, I think kind of what I hope to kind of convince to convey to you is, you know trying to move away from this one treatment algorithm fits all approach where um, our algorithm and many other algorithms, algorithms are dependent on basically what 
what is the oxygen requirement of these patients, but perhaps offering a, perhaps a more precision medicine-based approach to treat these patients with different agents based on their um, underlying uh, phenotype and some of these biomarkers. And ultimately, you know, trying to better understand the long haulers and these variants that are emerging, I think is a key issue as we continue to uh, uh, face the tail end of this pandemic. And just want to thank everybody who's really been involved. I mean, Alfred Lee and the um, cardio heme crew. You know, this underdog team was a term that Stephanie Helene from hematology uh, termed us because we're not uh, immunologists, we're not virologists, but you know, we're you know a number of clinicians and basic and translational scientists really interested in understanding, getting getting a better understanding of COVID nineteen. I um, really want to thank everybody who's been involved with different uh, aspects of the projects, including especially Alexandra, Eric, and Don for you know getting our clinical trials um, you know um, on, on back on track, and hopefully we'll get some results in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, terrific talk. Uh, and now I will pass the mic over to Dr. Erica Spatz for the final uh, presentation of the morning. Okay. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. And Young, you said that the year went fast, although it feels like a long time ago that you came over to draw blood um, uh, during a, a really sunny spring day on my deck for it to be a control. So it's amazing to see the work um, that you're doing. And I think um, it's a good segue into this um, really unknown and unstudied uh, aspect of COVID, which is often referred to as long COVID or long haulers, or more recently, the post-acute sequelae of coronavirus or PASC. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. I'll go quick, pretty quickly because I know we're at the um, top of the hour. Um, you've heard a lot about the long-term symptoms. Um, it's been all over the media, but um, mm -hmm. not really an area that's been focused on in the uh, medical community. Um, probably the best research on this comes from a patient-led research collaborative where they studied <clears throat> um, about 4,000 uh, people who responded to a survey. All of them were uh, having ongoing symptoms more than 28 days uh, beyond their infection. And uh, you could see that it was an international study um, although the primary group that responded were uh, white women around the ages of uh, 25 to 60. Um, some of the most common presentations are palpitations, tachycardia, chest pain. Um, one of the premier features of this long COVID syndrome is something called post-exertional malaise. And you may hear this in your practices where uh, people describe doing a bit of activity. Sometimes they even feel well with that activity but then they are completely wiped out over the next two days. And um, more than a third of people in this group uh, survey uh, described post-exertional malaise. And what's important is that when we see that, it's not just an isolated feature, they're coming in with a whole multi-system array of symptoms that include neurocognitive symptoms, often re referred to as brain fog, as well as um, cardiac symptoms. Again, a lot of chest pain, a lot of palpitations, a lot of dyspnea. Um, so we're really seeing a whole syndrome of, uh, of symptoms and this makes it very complicated. Um, this is also from that same group where they did a cluster analysis. And again, just showing that in cluster two, <clears throat> most of the cardiovascular symptoms come along with a much broader array of symptoms. Um, how does this, affect our clinical care. Um, currently, we are part of the uh, recovery program, the comprehensive uh, uh, post-COVID center at Yale that was started by uh, Dr. Uh, Jennifer Posick, Denise Lechman Singh, and Lauren Ferrante at, um, in the Winchester Recovery Program. And uh, we are one of several specialties, <clears throat> excuse me, that are seeing these patients. And it's a really kind of multidisciplinary approach because it's never the case that they just have one organ system that's being affected. Um, so, sorry. So, um, within this clinical program, um, we've seen about over 100 patients to date. Um, importantly, about two thirds had mild infection um, with the acute with their acute course with COVID, and most were not hospitalized. Many have no pre-existing conditions, and most have. Um, by the time they see me, their symptoms have been going on for 
sometimes more than three months. Um, some of the key phenotypes that we are seeing, um, yes, we are seeing pericarditis up in the right corner, myocarditis. Uh, we do see um, a lot of uh, LGE, although not a lot of um, edema at the time that I see them. And of course we don't do cardiac MRIs during their acute infection. So we don't know if that's specific to myocarditis from COVID or if that was pre-existing. Um, we do see that. And we do see some non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, stress-induced cardiomyopathies, but predominantly we see um, autonomic dysfunction as well as um, endothelial dysfunction. And so um, I really uh, have to uh, also acknowledge the many people in the test and uh, that have seen a lot of these patients. I've been referring um, many of these patients to try to further understand what is clinically um, happening. Um, so they are going to the uh, stress lab for cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Um, uh, Dr. Miller, thank you because you've been amazing at helping to interpret um, these really difficult studies in a syndrome that we don't understand. Um, and I've also want to give a special note to uh, Dr. Samit Shah, who's taken several of these um, patients to the cath lab to test um, endothelial dysfunction. And we have several who have demonstrated pronounced coronary vasospasm, also um, microvascular dysfunction. Also Dr. Lauren Baldessari, who's been helping to interpret our, our cardiac MRIs. I mean, it's a really complex process and I think that we're just at the beginning. Um, kind of as, uh, as uh, Hyung noted, um, I think we are really coming to terms with this being an endothelial disease, potentially not just in the acute phase, but also in the um, long phase. And I won't go through this, but I, the data are compelling um, that there's significant endothelial injury, there's significant um, vascular thrombo thrombosis, um, as well as angiogenesis. And uh, the SARS-CoV virus as seen in SARS-CoV-1 completely disrupts uh, several endothelial pathways. And I think that this is at the heart of um, many of the clinical symptoms that we're seeing in terms of uh, be it chest pain and coronary vasospasm, or potentially even oxygen delivery to the muscles, as well as oxygen uptake, uh, capillary load within the muscles, um, and then of course, uh, uh, metabolic uptake of, of oxygen. Uh, we also see a lot of autonomic dysfunction. Um, you've probably heard about a lot of POTS. I don't see that much POTS. I, be, I think that there's concern that we're overusing that um, uh, diagnosis, but certainly there's disruption to the autonomic system with inappropriate sinus tachycardia is one of the key features of this. Uh, people go to walk a few steps and their heart rate goes up to 130. Um, we are studying this through a grant from the CDC. And I also just kind of wanted to highlight some of the unique aspects of this um, study, which has been really um, fun and challenging, but also I think can help to uh, establish a broader infrastructure for doing research going into the future as Alexandra and Hyung had noted. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge our co-investigators, Arjun Venkatesh from the Department for Emergency Medicine and Harlan Krumholtz. This is a multi-center study that is looking at the long-term effects of COVID. Um, there are seven sites, Yale is the lead analytic site, and we're studying patients for 18 months of follow-up. Uh, the study is entirely virtual. Uh, we connect with patients virtually. We enroll them virtually, um, which has been a challenge, but we've kind of figured out the infrastructure and, and uh, the training and how to enroll a very diverse cohort. Um, we send them surveys to uh, capture patient reported outcomes, and then we have them connect to their clinical, uh, their medical records so that we can capture their clinical outcomes. Uh, we aim to enroll 400 participants per site, uh, 300 who are testing positive for COVID, um, compared with a control group of people who are sim also symptomatic but test negative for COVID. Um, the recruitment primarily takes place at the testing sites as well as in the community, and um, we've been working with the Yale um, YCCI cultural ambassadors to help to uh, spread the word about the study. Um, again, this is primarily around survey data as well as um, medical record data to understand outcomes uh, in these groups. I think one of the important things here as well is that 
um, with this infrastructure, um, we have the possibility to, we have a cohort who's established, we have their clinical phenotypes, and it really allows us to kind of think broadly about how to collaborate with other investigators who are looking at the biomarker imprints as you're doing, Hyung, or thinking about who might be appropriate for clinical trials. Uh, this kind of re research structure is absolutely needed if we're gonna make progress. Um, so that's one of the aspects that uh, Harlan is working on is really establishing a broader infrastructure beyond the CDC to have a kind of readiness cohort that can be ready and able to uh, be phenotyped and uh, uh, understand who might be eligible for different uh, studies. Um, I, I think I'll, it, uh, the primary outcomes for these studies um, uh, are the patient reported outcomes as well as the clinical outcomes. And then there's a specific outcome that the CDC wanted to study and I, uh, that's the chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalomyelitis. Uh, which really <clears throat> one of the hallmarks is that post-exertional malaise. Um, and uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, place to be, but I think I'm hopeful that we might be able to understand more of the pathophysiology behind this very elusive, frustrating disorder that many people have suffered from for a long time. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge um, a, a really great and collaborative study of um, uh, cardiac MRI and athletes who are testing positive for COVID. This was a partnered research study sponsored by the Heart and Vascular Center. And we compared um, MRI findings in um, uh, when the hockey players of Yale uh, tested positive for COVID. Um, and then we compared their MRI findings with um, a control group of lacrosse players. It was particular, um, Dr. Uh, Brad Kay of um, our, one of our premier cardiology fellows led this work. And we had several Zoom calls uh, where um, with uh, Yale Health Sport, Sports Medicine, um, Dr. Lampert, Dr. Young, Dr. Baldessari, Dr. Miller here, as well as the Yale hockey players who joined our um, research team. And part of having them on board was really kind of how do we do this well with um, uh, them as research partners? How do we uh, communicate findings from MRIs that we're not sure what the clinical significance are, how can we help manage um, in a safe way, but also uh, preserving their um, ability to return to play and not unnecessarily uh, benching them for findings that we're not certain of. Um, so this was a really wonderful study and in the process of being uh, written up and submitted. Um, what are some next steps? Um, there's uh, NIH put out an ROA on long COVID, and I know that um, many people were involved in several grants that went in, and I'm hopeful that this kind of research opportunity will advance the science in this area. I'm also uh, going to be leading an ACC roundtable on PASC, and um, hopeful that bringing together some experts from around uh, the world will help to uh, shed some light on this area and identify some important research opportunities. And then one other thing just to kind of note, and this kind of relates back to um, what Joyce was saying is um, the rehabilitation of long haulers, I think is very unique and we don't understand it, but the typical ways that we do cardiac rehab or pulmonary rehab are not working. And in fact, potentially worsening things. So we've been adopting um, here, I've been helping to translate the um, Levine protocol that um, Ben Levine, who's, um, exercise physiology um, expert, sports medicine expert down at UT Southwestern developed um, in relation to POTS. And many of us, um, many of the centers around are adapting this method and retraining our physical therapists on how to rehabilitate people because I think that probably holds the most um, promise for them to kind of reclaim their lives. Um, so with that said, I wanna thank um, both my clinical collaborators and research collaborators and the patients in the community who have been super um, patient as we try to um, you know, stumble our way through this um, vague diagnosis and learn how best to treat um, and people and uh, restore their quality of life. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I know we're kind of at the end of the hour and I think I will turn it back over to Dan and Eric, but I just also wanna say how grateful I am to be part of um, uh, of uh, cardiology here. And um, I think, uh, you know, the words of humility absolutely apply. 
resilience, it's amazing to see the resilience here and innovation. I'm so um, impressed with all of the work that's being done. Um, nothing like a crisis to bring about innovation and change. So I look forward to working with all of you and thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Spatz. It was absolutely terrific. Uh, conversation and thanks so much to uh, all of the speakers for sharing their experiences and demonstrating so many impressive and innovative clinical and scientific endeavors. It's really truly remarkable to reflect on the past year and, and to hear so many of your uh, inspiring stories. Um, uh, Eric, if, if you're interested and in, if you want to say a, a few final words. No, I, I think you, this is only a small snippet of, of the wonderful work uh, that's been going on, not only clinically, but in terms of our investigation. And also um, in how we innovated with regards to our ability to educate the next generation. I mean, I think uh, uh, many of us, and uh, I have a, a fair bit of guilt in, in the inability to, to actually meet as often um, socially with our with each of you and with our fellows, but I think there's been so much innovation in the, in, the, in 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 the face of this challenge as it relates to how we've conducted ourselves in educating um, our, our, our the next generation of cardiovascular uh, uh, docs. So um, so I think we have a lot to be proud of. I, I would suggest that anyone who has questions related to any of these presentations reach out to um, to uh, the great presenters themselves, and uh, maybe we can uh, stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. Velasquez, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Look forward to seeing everyone again next week for our next Cardiovascular Medicine Grand Rounds. Next week's presenter will be Dr. Sunil Rao from Duke. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Take care.